Good uh, evening, uh, everybody. Good uh, morning, uh, Matthew. Uh, it's a pleasure to open this series on theories of regulation uh, with you. Um, and we hope to have a lot of uh, material on regulation and governance uh, on the uh, in YouTube for, for, for students and for uh, us, the scholarly community. So today's lecture is by uh, Professor Matthew D. Adler who is the Richard Orovitz Professor of Law and Professor of Economics, Philosophy and Public Policy at Duke University. He's the founding uh, director of the Duke Center for Law, Law Economics and Public Policy. Uh, I would say that uh, Duke University is one of the centers of regulation research in the last decade or so. Um, very impressive uh, group of scholar who works uh, uh, together. Let me say also that Adler is the author of uh, the new foundation of cost benefit analysis, uh, well being and fair distribution, and beyond cost and, cost and benefit analysis. And one, one of the, the latest book of his books is Measuring Social, uh, Social Welfare and Introduction, which he will uh, present uh, today. So Adler, uh, Matthew, uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, David, for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, I hope everyone's okay. These are obviously really terrible times everywhere, uh, but I hope everyone is as well as one uh, can be. Um, okay, do you guys see that? see that okay? So uh, yeah, David suggested I talk for maybe 30, 40 minutes and then I'll, we can um, uh, discuss. Um, so as uh, uh, you know, David Conley said, um, uh, I've written, uh, uh, I work in the area basic of law and economics uh, uh, and public policy. Um, and a lot of my work has been about this notion of a social welfare function, SWF, um, uh, the social welfare function framework for policy evaluation, which, which actually originates uh, in theoretical welfare economics uh, uh, and is widely used now uh, in various economic literatures, such as optimal tax theory uh, and climate economics. Um, and my own scholarship has focused on this. Uh, uh, it's focused on sort of developing the philosophical underpinnings of this approach uh, and also applying it to a range of policy areas. Um, so as David kindly mentioned, uh, I have this book, Wellbeing and Fair Distribution. Uh, the book I'm gonna talk about today, uh, Measuring Social Welfare uh, um, uh, is a more recent book uh, on the framework. Um, uh, I am collaborating with Oli Norheim, uh, a uh, Norwegian uh, 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 doctor and public health scholar on a whole edited collection on prioritarianism and practice. Um, the approach that I favor, and I'll talk about this in a bit, is a prioritarian approach, which gives greater weight to those who are worse off. Uh, and this uh, collection is gonna look at, you know, the application of that to a whole range of uh, different policy areas. Uh, 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 I've written, I've been lucky to be able to collaborate with um, some fantastic co-authors, economists, uh, so uh, I've written specifically about the application of social welfare functions to climate policy uh, and to uh, risk regulation, uh, including something recent uh, on uh, COVID. COVID unfortunately makes clear just how important risk regulation is, uh, you know, as a policy matter. Um, this framework, um, you know, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, you know, uh, uh, what your uh, uh, backgrounds are. Uh, but for those of you who engage with philosophy, uh, uh, this framework sort of implements uh, a certain family of ethical views that is welfare consequentialism, right? So it views uh, appropriate governmental action uh, uh, in terms of the consequences, the social consequences uh, uh, of that, and specifically focuses on well being. That said, the approach is you know, fully flexible within the confines of welfare consequentialism as regards the nature of well being, um, you know, functional forms. And so on. So what I'm going to do, um, recognizing the time. Uh, um, so this is the book. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, uh, um, uh, but here it is. Uh, um, uh, let me say, you know, if any of you are, are, are seriously interested and are not able to get it, uh, I'm happy to send a copy. Uh, that takes a little longer now uh, with COVID, but I'm very happy to, to, to send a copy to anyone 
you know, who, who, who is interested and is, you know, is not able to get the book. Uh, but the book uh, uh, gives an overview of the framework, uh, which is meant to be accessible, but at the same time, rigorous. And there's a, there's a math appendix, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that provides more formal uh, backup. Uh, um, uh, uh, I talk both about the measurement of well-being uh, and about uh, the choice of social welfare function. Uh, and then, um, you know, I show, uh, and I'll talk about this in, in a bit, about how the approach can be implemented uh, in policy analysis. One of the things uh, which I'm trying to do in this book is really, uh, uh, and indeed in my work more generally, is show how this framework improves on cost-benefit analysis, right? So uh, in this case study, I contrast, uh, and I'll talk about this, uh, this framework uh, to cost-benefit analysis, uh, which of course is now the dominant policy tool uh, for policy analysis uh, as applied to risk regulation. Okay, so what I'll do now, you know, about 15 minutes or so, I'll talk about just the theory of it, uh, and then I'll talk about this uh, risk regulation case study, because uh, that really shows, uh, you know, uh, 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 how this works in practice and also how it differs uh, from cost benefit analysis. Um, uh, and I apologize, I, I have some, some formulas here, not too much. Uh, I also try to explain those, uh, you know, in language uh, for those uh, for whom those are not uh, the easiest things uh, to read. How does the framework work? I mean, in, in as, you know, uh, 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 framed most generally, um, uh, it converts outcomes. And again, we should think of these as social outcomes, right? This is a framework for, you know, a social planner, right? A governmental decision maker. Uh, so uh, it takes the possible outcomes uh, of uh, policy choice uh, and converts uh, each of those into uh, a well-being vector. That is a list of well-being numbers. Um, uh, for most of the book until chapter seven, I simplify things by assuming a fixed population of individuals, right? So there are n individuals uh, and a given outcome, you know, a, a way that society might go in terms of individuals' incomes and longevity and health and public goods, all that kind of stuff is expressed as a well-being pattern, right? That's the welfareism here. So given outcome X is uh, we have a well-being measure that converts that into a list of well-being numbers. So that's one critical component of the framework. Uh, uh, you know, in chapter two of the book talks in detail about how to do that. Um, and then we have the social welfare function, which is a rule for ranking these well-being vectors, right? Uh, so first we convert outcomes into, uh, you know, patterns of well-being represented uh, mathematically. And then we have some rule uh, for comparing these well-being patterns. I mean, the simplest rule, right? Which goes back to Bentham uh, is utilitarianism. You just sum up well-being numbers, uh, but there's a different approach, you know, pioneered uh, by uh, the now sadly no longer alive um, Oxford philosophy, uh, philosopher Derek Parfit, prioritarianism, uh, which uh, again gives greater weight to the worse off. Um, and then once we have, you know, we've converted outcomes into these well being vectors, and as a rule for, for ranking well being vectors, we can think of policies, governmental policies, you know, infrastructure policies, regulations, what have you we can view them as, you know, in effect, lotteries, probability distributions uh, across the outcomes, uh, 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 which in turn are converted into well-being vectors. So that, in, you know, in a minute is the whole framework. Obviously, there's a lot there. Um, again, you know, prioritarianism is the notion of, instead of just summing up well-being, summing up well-being plugged into this transformation function. And mathematically, that has the effect of giving priority to the worse off. So if you think of someone who is better off you know, at a higher well-being level and someone who is worse off at a lower well-being level, if we take you know, a, a fixed amount of well-being and shift that from the better off one, she goes down by this, to the worse off one, uh, if we sum up transformed well-being, that's going to be an improvement, right? Just by virtue of this concavity here. Okay, so um, now one thing about this framework, and this is, you know, as, as you may know, you know, in welfare economics, there's this long running dispute about well, whether well being is interpersonally comparable. Classical welfare economics, that is, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, as it develops uh, in the first part of the 20th century, says, hey, we don't need to make interpersonal comparisons. 
we don't need to compare well-being between different people. And indeed, one of the advantages of cost-benefit analysis is that it doesn't rely on interpersonal comparisons. By contrast, you know, this framework does. That's a feature of it. And that means that you need to have some way to come up with interpersonally comparable well-being numbers. I have a theory of that. Uh, you know, but in any event, this shows why interpersonal comparisons are required. So let's imagine we just got two people, Amy and Barry, uh, and three different outcomes. And let's imagine that you know, these are their well-being numbers. Now let's imagine that we cannot make comparisons between people. We can compare you know, uh, uh, well-being levels and differences within each individual life, but we can't make interpersonal comparisons. So what that means then is that if we rescale the numbers individual by individual, that rescaling will equally well represent the intrapersonal comparison. So for example, now we're taking the original well-being numbers and dividing by 10 for Amy. Uh, and you know, the information about Amy's well-being is equally re represented by these original numbers as it is by the rescaled numbers. Barry, let's imagine, you know, we don't change his numbers. So all the well-being information over here, person by person, is the same as the well-being information over here, person by person. It's just that the interpersonal comparisons change. Um, if you don't think interpersonal comparisons are possible, then you know this array of well-being numbers is just as good as this array. But the problem is that the social welfare function changes, right? If you take the utilitarian social welfare function or the prioritarian social welfare function, right, or any plausible social welfare function, if you, you know, uh, get rid of the interpersonal information, right? If you transform well-being in a way that only preserves intrapersonal information, things are gonna change. This is a formal way of saying that, you know, which in some ways is obvious. I mean, utilitarianism or any such rule relies on not just within person, but across person well-being comparisons. Okay, so we can, I can, I wanna, you know, I have a theory about how to do that. Um, uh, I talk about that in the book, uh, but I wanna, I want to, you know, I think as, as, a, as, a, as an intuitive matter, people agree you can make interpersonal comparisons. It's only within the confines of a certain view, you know, in uh, traditional welfare economics that there's skepticism about that. One of the things about, this framework, and this is what the, you know, uh, theoretical social choice part of it brings is, you know, if you think about it, there are many different social welfare functions, there are many different possible rules for ranking well-being vectors. Um, but by putting into play axioms, that is by putting into play different sorts of um, requirements that you might impose on a social welfare function, you can narrow down, in fact, dramatically narrow down, you know, the functional form. Um, so in a way, we're making sort of philosophical arguments. So these philosophical arguments are sort of given formal form in these axioms. And by doing that, we can sort of narrow down, uh, you know, what we think to be plausible social welfare functions. And indeed, my argument for prioritarianism is an axiomatic argument. Now, let me say, at the end of the day, these are, these are all normative matters, right? This is not a scientific question. It's a normative question. Uh, it's a matter for normative debate. Uh, 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 but, um, you know, uh, uh, that said, obviously, what policymakers do is to make normative choices, you know, within a framework of demo democrat democratic elections. Okay, so, so in terms of possible axioms, there's, these are, uh, by the way, now well-being numbers, right? So each of these is a vector. We're assuming just, you know, uh, simplicity, a population of four people, right? Uh, individual one, two, three, four, or you can call them by names, right? You know, Amy, Barry, uh, Charlie, David, whatever. Um, Strong Pareto says, if you make at least one person better off and no one worse off, that's an improvement. Economists take that to be just foundational. And I think, you know, welfare should take that to be foundational. If you can improve one or more pe person's well-being without hurting anyone else, of course, why wouldn't you want to do that? Anonymity or impartiality is a way to capture, you know, the ethical attitude of, yeah, impartiality, right? You don't give priority to any particular person's well-being just because of who they are, because of their name. It's not like we're going to say, you know, Amy's well-being uh, uh, has more weight than Barry's or vice versa. 
right? That can be expressed axiomatically through this impartiality axiom, which says if we take a given array of well being and just rearrange it. So we have the same well being pattern, you know, the only difference only is, is, you know, is in terms of which particular person is at which particular well being level, then there should be no change. By the way, I should say, so these symbols, I mean, you know, this means better than, this means equally good as, and this means, you know, at least as good as, that is better than or equally good as. Pico Dalton, I mean, this is the critical axiom that distinguishes between utilitarianism and prioritarianism. And one of the messages here, by the way, is I, I think there's, a, there's often an assumption that, hey, if you're a welfareist, you gotta be utilitarian. You know, and utilitarianism has various sorts of issues with it. Um, and, you know, the point, my point in the book, I mean, voting upon a lot of, you know, work uh, by others is that's not true. You can be a welfareist, but you can care about equity in the space of well-being. And one way to do that is to be a prioritarian. Uh, and so Pico Dalton uh, is a way to capture concern for equity in the space of well-being, right? What Pico Dalton says is if we take a unit of well-being uh, uh, and have a pure transfer, not a leaky transfer, a pure transfer of well-being from someone better off to someone worse off, that uh, uh, reduces the well-being gap between them. And again, it's a pure transfer, so total well-being remains the same, then that should be an improvement. Now, obviously, utilitarianism, you know, which just adds up well-being numbers, there's no difference, right? The sum of well-being is the same uh, on both sides. Uh, so this is the axiom that differentiates, you know, between utilitarianism and prioritarianism, right? So uh, uh, this is a case in which we take two units of well-being, we transfer two units from person three to person two. So person three goes down from 10 to eight. Person two goes up from four to six. If you're utilitarian, you say total well being is the same, no difference. If you're a prioritarian, um, that should be an improvement. Separability says basically that if there's some people who are unaffected, it doesn't matter what their well being is. That's hugely significant in practical terms, right? So if you, for example, if you think about prior generations as part of sort of the human population, whatever we do now is not gonna affect their well-being. If the social welfare function satisfies separability, we don't need to worry about what their well-being level was, right? Uh, we don't need to you know, make precise. So how well off exactly were you know, the ancient Romans or the ancient Greeks or the ancient uh, Israelis or what have you, right? Uh, that's a huge sort of convenience in terms of policy analysis. Uh, and indeed, both utilitarianism and prioritarianism satisfy separability. Uh, and then continuity says basically, you know, if one well being is vector is better than another, then small changes are not going to upset that. All right. So, in the, I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, <laughs> with a graphic designer putting together uh, this diagram for the book. This is in chapters three and four. Uh, what is cool is that, okay, so if we start with these two basic axioms of Pareto and anonymity, which seem just kind of fundamental, anonymity, you know, ethical impartiality and Pareto, uh, and then we have these additional three axioms I mentioned, separability, uh, um, continuity, and Pagu Dalton, you can sort of divide up the whole space of social welfare functions and see where they, where they fall using these axioms. Uh, uh, and in particular, as I, you know, uh, uh, separability, this, you know, we can ignore those who are unaffected, which is a huge convenience uh, uh, and continuity. Utilitarianism and prioritarianism are the only social welfare functions uh, or the only plausible ones that satisfy both separability and continuity. Uh, um, so, you know, uh, 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 and by the way, continuity also for mathematical reasons uh, is a big a convenience because if, if a social welfare function satisfies continuity, it can be represented by a mathematical function. So it's a huge uh, help. Uh, and then the big difference between utilitarianism and prioritarianism is in terms of equity. So if this is sort of equity, uh, Pugu Dalton, prioritarianism satisfies that, utilitarianism doesn't. So part of the book you know, is, is, to, is to lay bare these axioms and also argue about the axioms by bringing to play the philosophy, right? You know, we can sort of map different philosophical positions, utilitarianism, prioritarianism, um, you know, there's something in philosophy called sufficientism, uh, Leximin, which goes back to Rawls. These can be mapped onto different locations in axiomatic space. Okay, so let me, let me now, uh, I want to move on to the uh, uh, case study. 
So, you know, I think I've sort of already uh, uh, showed my cards. I mean, I think, you know, uh, uh, certainly from, for policy analysis, the most plausible possibilities are either utilitarianism or prioritarianism. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, for reasons of tractability. Uh, and then the choice between them is really uh, between having this equity axiom to Dalton uh, or not. Uh, uh, I can talk more about the pros and cons, but let me, let me, let me um, I wanna get questions and I wanna uh, show the example and I wanna talk about cost benefit analysis, right? I haven't talked about cost benefit analysis. Um, uh, sorry, so, so, I, so I, I use, um, David will laugh at this. So, so I, I refer to cost benefit analysis as CBA. Uh, there's an official society for cost benefit analysis in the United States, but that uh, calls it benefit cost analysis. They insist on calling it benefit cost analysis. Um, so I had prepared some slides uh, 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 for a presentation there, uh, where I referred to it as benefit cost analysis, and then I wanted to change it back to CBA, but I, I didn't do that completely on the slide. So sometimes I say CBA, sometimes I say BCA. It's the same thing, right? Benefit cost analysis, cost benefit analysis. Uh, uh, unlike the social welfare function approach, uh, 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 cost benefit analysis measures well being using money. Money is the measuring rod. That's the big difference, right? For social welfare functions, the measuring rod is this interpersonally comparable measure of well being. For cost benefit analysis, it's money. The idea is that we have some kind of baseline. Uh, and for any other policy, we uh, uh, translate the effect uh, uh, of the policy on a given person's well-being uh, 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 by asking, uh, you know, what she's willing to pay for the policy if she's better off in terms of money, uh, or what she would require to accept with the policy in return for it to be compensated uh, if she's worse off. So we, you know, again, we we, we take uh, well-being effects, but instead of trying to put them on a, a, a well-being scale which is a social work function approach, we try to measure them in money. That's, that's cost benefit analysis, right? And again, that's, you know, in the US at least, uh, despite many changes, I mean, despite, so, uh, despite the many differences between President Reagan, Bush 41, Clinton, Bush 43, uh, um, Obama, Trump, and Biden thus far, they have all used cost benefit analysis. <laughs> Biden may, Biden may get rid of it, but uh, uh, that hasn't happened yet. I mean, in the, in the U.S. since 1980, under Reagan, there's been this order which says that, um, you know, uh, administrative agencies uh, should uh, engage in cost-benefit analysis, at least we're consistent with the governing statute. And that's an important part of um, U.S. practice. Indeed, you know, uh, uh, Cass Sunstein, uh, you know, well, I think is undoubtedly the, the, the greatest, uh, um, you know, living U.S. law professor, legal scholar, uh, was, um, uh, you know, ran cost benefit analysis, uh, 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 left the academy for four years to do it uh, uh, under Obama. So it's an important post. Um, you know, there are various uh, defenses of cost benefit. We can talk about that, um, uh, 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 that I don't take to be fully persuasive. You know, I mean, I spent uh, 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 the first part of my career in a way defending cost benefit analysis or, or suggesting how it might be, might be defended. So I don't think it's a terrible thing. I just think that social welfare function approach uh, is an improvement. So, you know, I view cost benefit as a, as a great thing, but I think uh, the social welfare function approach is even better. Um, I wrote this book with uh, uh, Eric Posner. Um, uh, uh, Eric and I, Eric's in Chicago now, but he and I, uh, and I'm at Duke, but we were, I was very fortunate, you know, uh, uh, to be a colleague of his early in his career at, at, at UPenn Law School. And we wrote this book together uh, uh, that David mentioned, uh, New Foundations of Cost-Benefit Analysis. Um, and what we did in that book was to say that we could think of cost-benefit analysis as kind of a rough and ready proxy for utilitarianism. You know, it's a workable proxy uh, for utilitarianism, um, but it's not a perfect proxy, right? It's not a perfect proxy because money uh, you know, uh, is not a perfect proxy for well-being. Um, uh, you know, and my view now is we can do even better. You know, we can do even better. And indeed, I hope that uh, President Biden is going to push the cost-benefit apparatus in the United States to, you know, to improve on cost-benefit. Okay, so here's an example from the book. This shows, um, a there are a couple of things, you know, that, that I, I was trying to do in this uh, uh, chapter in the book. One is to show that this idea of the social welfare function is implementable. 
It's not just an academic idea. Now, in fact, you know, those who know the economics already know that because the idea is used you know, in these different literatures. It's used in, uh, as I said, the literature on affluent tax theory and climate policies and so forth uh, to you know, evaluate concrete policies. But still, I think it's important to show that this thing is implementable uh, you know, with sufficient uh, uh, bureaucratic effort and political will. Um, and also, you know, uh, this is meant to contrast cost benefit, uh, sorry, uh, the framework with cost benefit analysis. The application here is, is risk regulation, um, which is at least in the US, probably the most important application of cost benefit analysis, which is interesting, right? I mean, the biggest agency in the US that really does cost benefit analysis uh, um, is the Environmental Protection Agency for various reasons, um, which evaluates you know, these big clean air regulations or clean water regulations or what have you using cost benefit. They have this whole office of you know, uh, economic analysis. Um, and basically, you know, I mean, the major impact of these uh, anti-pollution regulations is redu reducing fatality risk, right? So a lot of what ec the economic analysis that EPA does is convert these risk reductions into dollars and then sort of compare them uh, with the costs, you know, in terms of compliance costs. So this is a big application of cost benefit. It was a big application before COVID and, you know, COVID again, of course, is obviously another huge case study in, in risk regulation, right? Deciding upon social distancing policies or vaccine allocation. Uh, social distancing cer certainly is in a way a trade-off between uh, risk reduction distributed you know, differently across the population, uh, obviously big heterogeneities in terms of uh, COVID risks uh, uh, as compared to the costs uh, of shutdown. I wrote this chapter before COVID, although I, I do have a COVID paper uh, 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 that I wrote. But so what this chapter simply imagines here is I built a simulation model based upon the US survival curve, right? The survival curve says for different groups of the population, you know, what is their uh, chance of surviving each year? That's something that, you know, demographers uh, collect every year for, you know, for the whole US population, looking for each age, basically, you know, uh, what percentage of the age group dies during the year. Um, so based upon uh, that information, you can conduct a, a survival curve. Uh, I took that uh, and then information about the income distribution and built this simulation model. And what I imagine was that the population is divided uh, into um, uh, uh, five different age groups, uh, age 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60, uh, and five different income percentiles based upon the in actual income percentiles of the US population. So I have a, you know, this sort of model population divided into five age groups, five income groups, so 25 different cohorts, I imagine. So 25 cohorts of equal size. Um, and I'm imagining some kind of risk reduction, one in 100,000 risk reduction. So this now seems quaint and charming, but in the day before COVID, the kinds of risk reductions that regulators thought about were one in 100,000, one in 10,000, one in 1,000, right? You know, COVID of course has seemingly, you know, uh, a population uh, infection fatality risk of, of one in 100. Uh, um, you know, which is orders of magnitude bigger. Uh, but in any event, I'm working with, you know, uh, what historically was considered to be sort of a, you know, a, a plausible uh, kind of risk from uh, a pollutant or what have you, right? So I imagine that I have a policy that, which will reduce uh, risks across these 25 cohorts by, uh, that is the risk of dying in the next year by one in 100,000, um, and then, of course, I, you know, but that's going to be costly, right? We're going to have to sort of uh, um, uh, require some kind of technology, which will lead to reduced consumption, reduced income. Uh, and so I'm trying to figure out, well, what are we willing to pay socially? What, what is the, 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 the total uh, uh, amount per capita that we're willing to pay for this 100,000 risk reduction? Um, and I imagine, okay, so one possibility is that this cost is spread uniformly. Here, I'm just assuming the risk is uniform. Let's just say it's a pollution risk. The cost might be spread uniformly, or uh, we might imagine that we use sort of the tax system to, to redistribute some of the costs. And so we might imagine that the costs are gonna be spread proportional to income, so, so more progressively. Um, and what I calculate is uh, for the different approaches, so for cost benefit, utilitarianism, 
or prioritarianism. Now, prioritarianism, uh, you know, um, uh, is, uh, I should have said this earlier, is not a single approach, it's a whole family of approaches, right? By picking the form of this transformation function, you can give more and more weight to the worse off, right? So, I mean, we can talk about that, but I, I, I hear in this, in this model, I, I, I pick kind of a moderate degree of priority for the worse off, uh, and I calculated kind of the break-even cost. What is the maximum per capita cost that these different evaluation approaches are willing to spend for the sake of a one in 100,000 risk reduction. Again, this is exactly the kind of thing which you know, EPA does all the time. Now, what is dramatic here is, I mean, what's to be observed for this slide is if the numbers are very different, the results are quite different. <laughs> um, in a second, I'll talk about what's going on here, uh, but CBA is actually willing to spend more, right? CBA is willing to spend uh, uh, um, more actually than utilitarianism. Uh, 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 or then prioritarianism, uh, uh, at least with uh, um, uh, uniform cost incidence. The other thing to note is that CBA is insensitive, and this is well known, CBA is insensitive to the distribution of costs, right? For CBA, a dollar is a dollar is, uh, is a dollar, right? You know, or whatever the unit of currency, right? So it doesn't really, it doesn't matter who bears that. So if you shift, if you, you know, have a fixed amount of cost and you shift that from the poor to the rich or the rich to the poor, that's not going to ch uh, 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 change total cost. And so CBA is not going to care either way. And that's what you're seeing here. By contrast, both utilitarianism and even more so prioritarianism, Cedar is power, but prefer to shift costs on to those who are better off because they recognize that, that money has diminishing marginal utility, right? And so both of these approaches are sensitive to cost distribution. And they, in particular, uh, uh, you know, are willing to impose greater costs for the sake of this risk reduction, if those costs are borne um, uh, 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 by the better off in the shape of a proportional reduction to income as opposed to an absolute uh, you know, fixed reduction. Um, all right, so let me, let me go through these, the, the, these charts and then we, can, then we can talk. But what this shows, I mean, in some ways these are the most, well, uh, I like these tables a lot. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what's going on here? What, what, the, what, what, what I've done, again, using the model, and again, with this population, so this is a model population which shows heterogeneity with respect to age and income. And I look at the social value of risk reduction as calculated by each of the three approaches, as calculated by CBA, as calculated by utilitarianism, and is calculated by prioritarianism with the sort of moderate degree of priority for the worse off. Now, what one means is the social value of risk reduction. Uh, uh, this is, you know, imagine a one in a hundred thousand reduction in current fatality risk for a uh, sixty-year-old low-income person. And then the numbers in the other cells are the social value of risk reduction as compared to that for a 60-year-old low-income person. So let's start with utilitarianism, right? Utilitarianism just sums up, this is risk. So we're talking about, you know, the, basically the sum of expected well-being. And uh, so if we reduce the risk by this benchmark individual, the 60-year-old uh, low-income person by a certain amount, um, you know, that increases uh, 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 the sum of expected well-being by a certain amount. If instead we reduce the risk of a 40-year-old in the same income percentile by the same amount, the utilitarian benefit is greater, right? In this case, the sum of expected well-being goes up by 1.8 times, you know, what it increases if the risk is reduced for the 60-year-old low-income person, right? So basically, so, so what you see here is that in utilitarian terms, there are two effects here. One is that holding constant income, the young get priority. I mean, it's not surprising, but it's confirmed here, right? Utilitarianism, holding constant income, utilitarianism prefers to give a unit of risk reduction to younger people as opposed to older people, right? So a unit of risk reduction uh, in terms of utilitarian value if given to a 20 year old within this income band has 2.8 times the value, 2.8 times the social value that it does for giving the same unit of risk reduction to a 60 year old. Um, and the same is true, you know, within each income band, right? The numbers go up 
as the individuals get younger. Why is that? Well, basically it's because um, younger people uh, 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 have more expected life years to live, right? If you take a 20 year old and imagine she's gonna die this year and you save her, her life expectancy remaining is much bigger than if you do the same thing for a 60 year old, right? Uh, I mean, given a normal survival curve. So life expectancy remaining uh, goes down as people get older. And so you know, you're know, you producing in terms of lifetime well-being, you know, we're, we're thinking here in, term, in lifetime terms. So utilitarianism sort of maximizes the sum of expected lifetime well-being. The benefit gets smaller as you get uh, older. The other thing about utilitarianism is that the benefit gets bigger, holding constant age, the benefit gets bigger as people get richer. This is an unattractive feature of utilitarianism, right? Uh, the idea here is that, you know, look, if we think money is a good thing and more money is a better thing, then as compared to not being at all, you know, to, to dying during a year, to not being alive during a year, living at a certain level of income uh, is not as good as living at a, at a higher level of income, right? If income's good, then you know, uh, uh, higher income is better. And uh, as compared to not being alive at all, having more income uh, is better than having less income. And that in turn means if you're being utilitarian that holding constant age, you know, risk reduction uh, has more social value if the risk reduction is given to a richer person. That's not a great feature, right? Prioritarianism, because it gives priority to the worse off, you know, uh, uh, including those at lower income. Here you can see prioritarianism actually gives priority to the poor. So the numbers, while the numbers for utilitarianism uh, uh, as we increase income holding constant age uh, go up, the numbers for prioritarianism with this moderate degree of priority for the worse off actually go down. So prioritarian kind of neutralize utilitarian preference for the rich. I think that's a nice thing. Um, the other thing is to see the contrast with cost benefit. Cost benefit, um, is like utilitarianism in giving preference uh, in terms of risk reduction for the poor, but cost benefit dramatically increases, dramatically sort of exacerbates the utilitarian preference for the rich. And the reason for that basically is that, you know, cost benefit um, takes changes in, in, in people's well being and converts that into uh, uh, an income equivalent and a money, a money equivalent by dividing by each individual's margin utility of income. Richer individuals have a lower margin utility. And so the income equivalent, uh, you know, uh, for the very same sort of well being effect, if delivered to a rich person, has a bigger monetary equivalent uh, than if delivered to a poor person. And the effect of that in this model is that uh, uh, cost benefit is dramatically skewed towards, um, um, you know, giving risk reductions to the rich. On the income side, this is the same exercise now with income. So now we imagine, you know, not uh, giving a one in a hundred thousand reduction in risk to each person, but rather just changing their income by a certain amount. Um, you know, uh, one here uh, means uh, the one in a hundred thousand risk reduction uh, for the six-year-old. So one means the same thing as it did in the prior slide. What is dramatic, of course, is that for cost benefit, the numbers are all the same, right? Cost benefit says, you know, for any given effect on someone's well-being, what's the monetary equivalent? What does that mean? So how much is anyone willing to pay if her income goes up by a dollar? Well, it's a dollar, right? The monetary equivalent for a dollar is a dollar. Or the, you know, and so cost benefit is simply neutral to the distribution of income. By contrast, utilitarianism prefers, um, uh, you, you know, it says there's a bigger effect for a given change in income uh, if that effect occurs, uh, if that change occurs, uh, income change occurs to someone who was poorer, uh, and prioritarianism even more so. Um, okay, I will, um, let me stop there. David, does that make sense? So just to take questions. Uh, I mean, this gives you a flavor of it. I can, I can you know, um, um, and I will. Um... Yeah. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll stop the share. I mean, if, if need be, I may need to go back to the slides to answer questions. Uh, and I have, um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so uh, please uh, come in with uh, questions. Um, anyone wants to go first? Uh, Ophel, please. Hi, this was fascinating. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, yes thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I have kind of like a side question. I, I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit about the ways to measure well-being uh, outside of a cost-benefit analysis method. Uh, what are the weights you assign to different aspects in order to reach the grade? Um, I mean, in your charts under the utilitarian, how do you get to the numbers? <laughs> if you can elaborate a little bit about that. Yes, so um, let me put this, I, I, I'll put a slide up because uh, um, maybe this will, maybe I hope this will help. Uh, um, but, you know, so again, I don't know, you know, your, all of your areas of, of, of research, but in economics, I mean, there's, there is um, in decision theory, um, you know, there's this notion of, of, of uh, uh, utility functions, right? A utility function, uh, and in particular, uh, what's called um, uh, a von Neumann uh, Morgan certain utility function. Basically the idea is that, you know, people um, have uh, preferences and indeed preferences over lotteries. Um, so preferences over income lotteries or, you know, whatever the bundles of attributes might be. Uh, and those preferences, um, you know, assuming the preferences are well behaved, are represented by these von Neumann, von, von Neumann Morgenstern functions, right? I mean, there's a you know huge amount of economics that does that. Um, so if one, which I do in this book, adopts a kind of a preference view of well-being. So the simple case is let's assume everyone has the same preferences. I mean, you know, not the same preferences over final outcomes, but let's assume that everyone has the same preferences over bundles, right? So if we think about what might happen to a person in terms of, again, their longevity, um, their health each year alive, their leisure and so forth, the simple case is let's assume everyone has the same preferences. Um, then one can simply take this, you know, von Neumann Morgenstern utility function and use that as the well being measure. I mean, that's, that's sort of the idea. Um, the complication is, well, what if people have different preferences, right? What if people have different preferences, right? Uh, what do you do then? Um, so, so what I do in the book, I mean, this is a long argument, but I say in that case, basically, we uh, take the different utility functions representing the different preferences in the population. And then we have to scale them. One of the things, by the way, and again, I realize this, for those of you who haven't seen this, there's a lot going on. For those of you who, who, who do already know this, this will make some sense. Uh, you know, each, a, a given utility function, a given VNM utility function is not unique. It's just unique up to a linear transformation. And so you can scale it. You can scale it up and down, and that will equally well represent the preferences. If we have different preferences, then in effect, we have to choose the scaling factors, right? Um, and there's an element of normative choice here. Um, so this is, you know, and I talk about this in chapter two of the book, but basically um, let's imagine, you know, we have three different bundles and we have two different um, preferences out there in the population. And by the way, you know, how you would deal with this is a modeling question. At the end of the day, these approaches are gonna be implemented by having some kind of model so you might have a very simple model that says everyone has the same preferences, or you might, you know, uh, allow for some degree of preference heterogeneity. Um, so, you know, these are two different utility functions representing the different preference structures. And then what I show here is that we can take each of these and we can sort of, you know, multiply them by different scaling factors. And that will lead to different sort of interpersonal comparisons. Um, uh, 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 um, it will respect for people with the same preference by using the VNM utility function, you're kind of, you're respecting their preferences. Um, and by choosing the scaling factors, you're making comparisons between people with different preferences. That's the approach. I mean, I, I'm, I have a, I have a, you know, I, I uh, uh, um, uh, there's a, you know, a lot of uh, 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 argumentation under the hood needed to show why this is really justifiable. But the, the, the point, the basic point is that by taking, for, for people, you know, who have the same preferences, by measuring well-being using their utility function, we're respecting those preferences. What if, you know, uh, the, the, the person who's using this approach doesn't like a preference view of well-being, right? There are other views of well-being. There's a happiness view of well-being. 
people talk about capabilities. Um, how do we measure um, uh, well-being in that case? Well, in that case, you know, in effect, the that decision maker is imposing her own view of well-being, right? She is uh, rather than simply applying uh, the utility function out there, representing people's preferences, she has in effect her own ranking of bundles and her own ranking of bundle lotteries, and then she's going to have a well-being measure representing that, which will again represent both well-being levels and well-being differences for the different bundles. Um, so yeah, I, you know, it can be done. I mean, what, what in a way this justifies, so in, in existing work on the approach, so for example, nominal tax theory, um, you know, the, the approach is operationalized by going out there and seeing what people's actual utility functions are. So I'm, I think that that's right. Again, if one, if one likes preferences, then you can look at these utility functions that represent preferences and preference lotteries and lotteries, and, sorry, uh, represent preferences and over things in lotteries. Uh, and you can use that as the basis for well-being. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, I'd like to ask you um, uh, to take you to the pandemic uh, control measures uh, and to risk regulation and to ask in uh, which respects uh, we can see uh, good examples of using the cost-benefit anal analysis of pari or pariotanism or utilitarian, utilitarian uh, decision-making uh, at the state level, at the federal level, agencies level, et, et cetera. C can we, is it relevant at all? And if so, where? Uh, and is it uh, only function of the, of the kind of the crisis, decision making uh, in, in crisis situation is probably less uh, um, uh, convenient for, for such an analysis? Well, again, I, I mean, as uh, you know, you know, different countries have handled it differently. I think you guys have done a lot better job than the United States. Uh, um, but certainly, I mean, it's uh, so one big issue is social distancing. Uh, and indeed, there's a lot of work. You probably know this, but there's a, there was a, um, a huge amount of you know, uh, work in economics. The papers are written very rapidly. Uh, about initially about social distancing and about you know the, the extent of social distancing, what the optimal social distancing policy would be. Would it be a total lockdown? Would it be sort of you know um, how would you differentiate? Um, and there's a you know uh, a great sort of a rapid response journal called COVID Economics that has all this stuff. So that's you know I mean that's a now was that done in the United States? No, uh, you know for political reasons. Uh, but you can think of um, the choice of social distancing policy is a trade-off between, well, let me put it this way, right? I mean, um, some of this depends upon people's um, risk perceptions. In the US, for example, there's some of the population which is not worried about uh, the virus. And for that population, let's, you know, the choice of social distancing is a choice between making them safer uh, and reducing their income, right? If you don't impose a social distancing measure, they're gonna go out and they're gonna get sick or be exposed to higher risk, but they're also gonna make money, right? For a different part of the population, people like me, there actually is not a trade-off, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my house. I'm not gonna go out and um, you know, uh, engage in economic activities until I'm assured that things are safer, right? So that's sort of a no trade-off world, the actual population is a mix, right? But to the extent that, and also at a certain level, you know, let's imagine we get, you know, the virus is under control now, uh, but there's still a baseline risk, right? Social distancing beyond that is gonna be a trade-off between risk reduction and uh, uh, income. So very much like traditional um, pollution control. The other big thing, of course, which we're facing now is vaccine allocation. How do you choose between different groups, right? Now there, um, and I'll put this up. I mean, this, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, for those of you who are interested, I'm happy to share the paper. I've written, paper, you know, a paper, again, closely related to chapter five, but with a COVID model. But if you think about, um, sorry. You know, the population, and the question is, who, you know, who should get the vaccine first? 
I mean, we're out, we're facing this right now in the United States. Um, um, there, there are two different things. One is the social value of risk reduction for the different approaches, depending upon age and income. So for a fixed reduction of fatality risk, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, who takes priority, right, in terms of social value. With COVID, though, what's dramatic is that there, you know, there's a huge skew by age, right? I mean, it seems like if you're, you know, 80-year-old, the infection fatality risk is on the order of 10%. If you're a 70-year-old, maybe it's 2%, right? Uh, if you're a 20-year-old, it's much, much smaller. So, um, the, so basically, you know, to figure out vaccine allocation, you'd want to interact this chart, which shows the social value of a fixed reduction uh, by age and income with the, the infection fatality risk, right? With the infection fatality risk. So that, for example, I mean, let's imagine we're being prioritarian. Prioritarians give a lot of preference to the young. I haven't really explained why, but again, I'm thinking of all this in terms of lifetime terms. You know, from a lifetime perspective, the young are worse off than the old, right? The young have not attained the lifetime well-being of the old, and some of them won't. So from a lifetime perspective, the young are worse off. That is why prioritarianism for a given unit of risk reduction prefers to allocate that to the young, even more so than, than utilitarianism. On the other hand, you know, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if we're thinking about, you know, preventing infection by vaccination, the infection fatality risk, that is the risk of dying conditional being infected for a 20 year old is way, way smaller than it is for a 60 year old. So basically to think about who gets priority in terms of vaccination, you would multiply each number in each cell by the infection fatality risk for the cell. And what then emerges is that even despite the fact that prioritarianism gives preference to uh, the young for a fixed risk reduction in terms of, you know, uh, the COVID vaccine, it'll give priority to the old. Um, um, yeah, so that's, this, you know, concretely, now, here's another concrete thing. I mean, there's been a lot of writing out there, um, you know, a whole lot of people have said, well, um, um, you know, Zika Manuel, for example, who's a prominent uh, uh, health ethicist, um, and others have argued for a kind of utilitarian criterion for uh, vaccine allocation, by which they mean, you know, we should allocate the vaccine so as to maximize uh, life saving. Utilitarianism does that, but utilitarianism also, they don't say this, is also skewed towards the rich, right? If you were actually were utilitarian, you'd say, give the vaccine to richer people because they, you know, their lives are better. And so you want to create more goodness. The nice thing about prioritarianism is that with respect to vaccine allocation, prioritarianism, again, favors the young, but doesn't favor the rich. Cost-benefit, here's the dilemma. Cost-benefit, you can either do cost-benefit with a sort of a single, with, with, with you know, uh, uh, you know the, these different sort of valuations by a group, and cost-benefit was, you know, uh, has the, 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 the uh, deplorable, really, implication of being more biased towards the rich, or you can do cost benefit using just a single population average value. You can say, what's the risk reduction on average for the whole population? And then cost benefit says there's no preference, right? There's no reason to, for a given unit of risk reduction, to give a preference to the young as opposed to the old. Um, now, I think that's also problematic. So yeah, I mean, this is a long-winded way of saying, that, you know, there, there's a lot of relevance. Indeed, I think COVID, you know, just shows exactly how these, um, you know, risk income and risk allocation methodologies are very, very relevant. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Um, one more and last question. Uh, Sharona, sure. please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, really, really interesting. Unfortunately, uh, I think I should have read the book before our uh, meeting today. <laughs> but uh, I see, I'm happy to send you a copy of the book. <laughs> As mentioned, I'm happy really? to send you a copy uh, of the book. Um, nobody introduced themselves uh, today, but I'm researching long-term care and changes of policy and financing of long-term care. So the whole idea of, of measuring uh, social benefits is definitely uh, part of what we're looking into. So it's really interesting for me. Um, I just wanted to ask about the COVID, about what you, you talked about right now. 
Two things. One, um, how do you uh, treat short-term and long-term costs? Because that's also an, uh, um, one, you know, one, one side of it. And another thing is, um, especially when you're talking about allocation of vaccination, there's also the issue of what um, impact will, uh, will uh, the distribution have on spreading of the infection and not only fertility rates. So it's just a right. little more complicated. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, these are important questions. I mean, so, so in some sense, I mean, what's most important is sort of the framework for analysis. I mean, so my view is that basically in theory, you should analyze a policy in this. So in this case, you know, um, uh, you know vaccine, vaccine policy, what have you, by dividing the population into these into cohorts, right? So you model the population as existing in different cohorts. You know, I think certainly for risk uh, uh, issues, uh, the cohorts should be age cohorts and then within each age cohort, uh, income cohort. That would be kind of a modeling framework. And then for a given policy, you wanna look at the effect of the policy on the cohort in, in terms of everything, again, or, or, as, or, or as much as you can model. So in terms of risk, I mean, and that would be not just risk this, next, this year, but down the road, but also in terms of costs. So both in terms of immediate costs and then you know, later costs. Now that's, that's difficult. But that's really, that's a, that's a predictive question. I mean, that's kind of the modeling you would do as part of policy analysis. And so that's both risk incidents and cost incidents. And then we have, then, then, you know, for my framework, you need to convert that into well-being. I mean, how to do that, that was, that was Ofer's question. And that's, you know, um, I would do that in principle using these uh, utility functions representing the different preferences out there. Specifically, what I did in, 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 in the simulation model was to assume that lifetime well-being for a given longevity is the sum of the log of income for each of your life. So, I mean, this is kind of a standard, you know, economists use not just income, but log of income to capture dem diminishing margin utility. And so basically, I'm just summing up log income. And then, what, then you know, a given policy will either change, you know, uh, your risk. So, in, you know, increase the chance of living longer and also reduce income. Those are the two effects. So you have to model those effects in terms of you know, um, survival probabilities and income each year if alive. And then on top of that, I put this you know, um, sum of log income each year function to calculate lifetime well-being. And then on top of that, I can put you know, utilitarian or prioritarian social welfare function. So in a way, what you're, what you're pointing to is the difficult stuff. I mean, once we've divided the population into cohorts and model the effects in the cohorts, to actually put you know, a well-being measure and, and, and social work function on top of that is not that difficult. But what I would say is, you know, um, but the critical thing is, I, I say is to do it that way. Plus benefit does the modeling and then says, hey, let's convert that into dollars. And in my view, you know, that's fine. But again, that's problematic. That's not as good as we can be doing you know, for, for, for the reasons that I, that I, that I uh, alluded to. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Thank you very much all for uh, participating. We had a very interesting talk, uh, eye openings for political scientists like myself, public policy analyst, analysts. And there is a lot for me to, to read and to learn from you, Matthew. So thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to have you here in the first uh, of my, many talks, I, I hope, on the topic of regulation and governance. Thank you very much, David, and thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you everyone for, for, for spending time and, and, and giving me a chance to talk about the book. Yeah. Good afternoon, good evening. Thank you. Stay, stay safe, bye. Thank you.